let's talk base stocks. Now we know that lubricants are made of two primary components. We've got the base oil, and then we also have the additives. Now the base oil tends to comprise anywhere between 80 and call it 100% of the total formulation, depending on the kind of oil. So engine oils, a little bit less base oil, something like a compressor oil or even a transformer oil, a lot more base oil. Now, to distinguish between base oil and base stock, there's not really a, a definition there, but I'm going to use base oil to mean what goes into a finished lubricant and base stock as being the components that make up that base oil. So let me explain. Where do mineral oils come from? We've covered this on the channel before, but for the most part, we take crude oil that's either taken out of the ground or increasingly in the deep waters of the ocean, you go down and there is some kind of uh, reservoir uh, deep underground. Now, these reservoirs don't look like a giant lake or anything like that. The, the oil or the gas is embedded in what is generally sandstone, but obviously we have had the shale revolution quite recently where the oil tends to be held in much less permeable rock. So we drill a well and we extract crude oil. Now, crude oil is a natural product. It comes from the breakdown of organic material. So it's a mix of all kinds of different molecules. I've often used the analogy that it's like Lego. We get a whole bunch of different Lego bricks, uh, different shapes, sizes, colors, and the exercise in refining is an exercise in kind of moving these piles and separating them out into things which are like for like. But that process is not perfect. Now, broadly speaking, what are the kinds of Lego box that we're looking for? We've got paraffins, aromatics, and naphthenes. These are three very broad groupings for all of the molecules that are in a barrel of crude oil. Paraffins look like straight chains, aromatics have benzene rings, and naphthenes also have ring structures as well. Now, again, broadly speaking, the aromatics are toxic or carcinogenic, and so we want to remove them as much as possible. As we move from a group one oil to a group two oil to a group three oil, we are slowly making that base oil more paraffinic. And eventually, when you get to group four PAOs, they are almost purely paraffinic. Now, this kind of triangle also ignores the fact that there are some naphthenic base oils that are derived from naphthenic crudes. They have a lot more ring structures. They tend to have much lower VI, but much higher solvency. Now, our definition of mineral versus synthetic has been a little bit muddied, right? So uh, as we've covered on this channel before, there was a legal case between Mobile and Castrol, which really decided what could be called synthetic versus what could be called mineral. The upshot was Mobile lost, Castrol one, and now group threes, which are highly refined mineral oils, can be called synthetic. And therefore, synthetic is more of a performance term than it is kind of like a point of origin. So if we look at the API base oil groups, you can see that there's group one through five. Now, if you remember, one, two, and three are derived from paraffinic crudes, but group three and four are synthetic now under that new definition. Group four is the polyalpha olefins, and group five is a catch-all group for everything that is not in the first four. So that comprises vegetable oils, silicons, naphthenic base oils, as well as alkylated naphthalenes, esters, polyacrylene glycols, basically anything that you can dream up. Now, let's just focus on the mineral oils for a second, because if we want to take mineral oils, we can make a whole range of different products. Even if you look at the ISO viscosity grades, for example, they go from 10 all the way up to 6,800, and even beyond that, when you talk about some of the open gear lubricants, or even thinner than 10 when you're talking about some things like high-speed spindle oils. So obviously, we need to use a mix of different base stocks that come from mineral-derived sources in order to make this array of different lubricants. Now, let's take an engine oil, for example. Let's say I wanted to make a lubrication expert 10W30. I need a couple of components, right? As we mentioned before, I need base oil and I need additives. Now, for additives, I will go generally to an additive manufacturer. So someone like a Lubrizol, Chevron Oronite, maybe an Afton Chemical, something like that, which supplies additive packages. This is very common in the engine oil world. It's very rare these days that you would do what's called component formulation, where you put and, and select individual additives to make up the, the engine oil. With engine oil approvals being what they are and being so expensive, generally the additive companies are where you go to for an additive package. For, for a base oil, you might go to someone like an ExxonMobil. So ExxonMobil has a range of different base oils and you might select something from their group two mineral range. Now, their group two minerals are known under the EHC banner. I don't actually know what that stands for. I'm guessing the HC is for hydrocarbon. 
Now, if you look at their prospectus, what you'll see is that they have a range of different groups of mineral oils that range from EHC 45 all the way through to EHC 110. Now, broadly speaking, as the number gets higher, the viscosity goes up. So they list the viscosity at 100 degrees Celsius as a range. I've taken roughly the middle of that range. And using the listed viscosity indexes, I've shown what that would roughly equal to at 40 degrees Celsius, so we can make comparisons for the sake of our ISO viscosity grades. Now, specifically for engine oils, if you look at the SAE viscosity grades, so not the W ones, but the standard temperature ones, you, if you want to make a 30, you've got to be between 9.3 and 12.5 center stokes at 100 degrees Celsius. Now, that kind of limits our options because you can see that EHC 45, 50, and 60 all sit quite substantially below that. So in order to make a 10W30, I could probably make it with a combination of these base oils. So I could take an EHC 45 and load it up with a bit of 110, or an EHC 50 and load it with a bit of 110 to reach the viscosity that I want. Now, for practical purposes, I could probably just use an EHC 50 and then put in a whole bunch of viscosity index improvers. That's probably how you would go about formulating that lubricant. But I'm just trying to demonstrate that there's no such thing as a 10W30 base oil. You have to select from the base oils that are available on the market. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So if you looked across the different applications, you can broadly say that as we go from left to right, we need more viscosity. So automatic transmission fluids are very thin. Then you um, go through light duty engines where you know 0W20 is very common, 5W30 is common, heavy duty engine oils, now you're getting up to a 10W40 or a 15W40 is the most common. Turbines and compressors kind of sit in that ISO 32 to 68. You've got hydraulic oils, which can go anywhere up to, let's say, 150. Then you've got your automotive gear systems. Again, that's sort of like your 75W90 or even something like an 80W140. And then you've got marine engines, which are an SAE 50, roughly, and then the industrial gear sets, which can go, you know, typically in the ISO 320 to 460 range, but anywhere up to kind of 680, 1000, 1500. So if I want to formulate anything with a group two lubricant, I'm really limited in that I can only go so far as about a hydraulic system, because that's, that's all of the viscosity that's available to us. And if I want to do it with a group three, I'm even more restricted. And this follows a general principle, which is that when you refine something more, you reduce the viscosity. And that's why the group threes are available in a narrower viscosity band than is a group two. But what if I want to make something that is a little bit thicker? Can I do that with the range of group two lubricants that I have available? The answer is no. And so if I want to make a mineral oil, I'm either going to have to substitute it with additives or I'm going to have to substitute it with a group one bright stock, something like that. So again, as we, as we talked about, the principle is if you refine something more, it tends to get lower in viscosity. So group ones being the least, least refined tend to be available in higher viscosities. And that's why the bright stocks are such an important component of the base stock market, because it enables us to make higher viscosity fluids with relatively cheap uh, mineral bases. Now, the other alternative is I could use a synthetic. So as we talked about, group four is the polyalpha olefins, and these are available in a very broad range of different viscosities. Now, the reason for that is that, going back to our Lego analogy, synthetic lubricants are like if I took the same Lego brick and then I stacked them on, to on top of each other to make something bigger. Now, if I just let the reaction go on longer, what I can create is longer molecular chains. Longer molecules generally equals more viscosity. So our flexibility with PAOs is that I can make both very low viscosity as well as very high viscosity base stocks. Now, let's say I want to make something bio-based. The vegetable oils are available in a very narrow viscosity band as well. And this is because Mother Nature tends to like making carbon chains that are sort of like in the 16 to 18 carbon chain range. And of course, the length of a carbon chain is typically going to determine its viscosity. Now, we can polymerize these vegetable oils together to make longer carbon chains, but then you're not really calling it a vegetable oil, right? Because you've kind of synthesized the molecule. And in fact, that's what we do with some of the synthetic ester type loop. Now, one thing to note is that the mineral oils and the synthetic oils actually come from different parts of the value chain. That is to say, the minerals generally come from refining, where you would also produce things like fuels, as well as something like bitumen, uh, jet fuel, diesel, all of that kind of stuff. Whereas the synthetics tend to come from the petrochemical industry. So that sort of makes sense, right? With the mineral oils, we're taking crude oil and refining it. With petrochemicals, we're taking smaller molecules like 
let's say, uh, ethylene, and we are building them up to create a larger molecule. Now, there is, of course, a third value chain, which I've kind of ignored, which is the LNG value chain, where you can get the group three pluses, that is to say, the GTL liquids. Now, when you actually look across some of the base stock suppliers, what you'll find is that they don't tend to be able to offer the complete range of different base stocks that are on the market. So take Chevron, for example. Chevron has a family of both group two and group three base stocks. Now, they would argue group two plus, group three plus, but I'm not going to split, hair, split hairs here. Now, you might think, well, hold up. I know that Chevron has uh, synthetic base stocks. They sell PAOs. They kind of do, but it's Chevron Phillips Chemical, right? They're the ones that are actually selling the PAO. Now, if you look at someone like Shell, they're most famous for the GTL product, right? So that's something that they offer. And ExxonMobil, which as far as I know, is the biggest base stock supply in the world, has group one and two. There's a gap where they don't sell any group three or GTL. And then you've got the group four PAOs, which they're obviously quite well known for. Hopefully that's given you a little bit of a window into the wonderful world of base stocks. This is obviously very introductory, but there is a lot that goes behind just making a lubricant. If you head over to the website lubrication.expert, I'm building a platform to make the job of a lubrication expert that much easier. There's a range of application-based training modules as well as certificate preparation, including ICML's MLA1, MLT1, VIM, and VPR. MLA2 and MLA3 are coming later this year, as well as hopefully CLS. There are tools for lubricant and viscosity selection, and I'm starting to run bi-weekly Zoom meetings where we can all just catch up and share our experiences as lubricant professionals. Best of all, while a range of certification courses are in the order of $1,000 US dollars each, all of this is available for $100 US dollars a month.